Kia ora, g'day and welcome to the history of Aotearoa New Zealand, episode 3, Kupe and Tawhiki. Kupe was a rangatira, a great fisherman who lived in Hawaii. Surrounding Kupe's settlement were the traditional fishing grounds where Kupe and his tribe caught their fish. When the moon and the tides were right, the fishermen headed out to sea, always returned with waka laden with fish of all colours and sizes, gifts from Tangaroa and Hine Moana, which the whole tribe celebrated. The people gathered at the shoreline to greet them when they returned, to divide the catch so that each whānau had an even share. One morning, when the fishermen lowered their lines at one of their favourite fishing grounds, they didn't get the expected tug on their lines. Instead, when they pulled their lines from the water, their bait had vanished. This continued through the morning and into the day, and not one fisherman caught a single fish. This had never happened before. Many of the tribe were upset when they returned. They secretly accused the fishermen of disrespecting Tanganoa and therefore causing their misfortune. Once Kupe had considered the happenings of the day, a hui was called. The whole island gathered around the evening fire to discuss the fate of their village. Kupe firstly spoke of his respect for the sea of Tangaroa and Hine Moana, and how they had sustained their village since time began. Kupe also spoke of the fishermen who had generously fed and looked after their tribe since he was a young man, and how respected they were within the Fano. He committed himself to finding out exactly what had happened. Early the next morning, Kupe and the fishermen lowered their lines at their favourite fishing grounds, only to have their bait taken as it happened the day before. Kupe tried reciting a karakia that would draw fish to his line, but when he pulled it from the depths of the ocean, his bait was gone. Kupe noticed a slimy substance covering his hook and recognised it as belonging to an octopus. He knew it would be useless to continue fishing and ordered the others to pull their lines from the water. Once more, they headed back to shore empty-handed. That evening, Kupe set out to the other side of the island, where a chief called Mutarangi resided. Kupe knew that Mutarangi had a pet octopus, renowned for its huge size and influence in the sea world. Kupe described to Mutarangi what had been happening to their fishing grounds, stating that it was the work of an octopus. He asked if perhaps Mutarangi's pet could possibly know who was responsible. Mutarangi looked at Kupe and laughed. Ha! I don't tell my pet when to eat or what to eat. If it chooses to eat your bait or your fish for that matter, then that's what it does. Mutarangi then asked Kupe to leave. Then I will slay your pet, Tefekio Mutarangi, and it will never trouble my people again, Kupe stated as he left. Unless it kills you first, was Mutarangi's reply. Kupe gathered his people and began to build a canoe, a large, ocean-going canoe which he called Mataharua. When the vessel was complete, Kupe stocked it with supplies, readying it for a lengthy sea voyage. Kupe's wife, Hine Taaparangi, their whānau, and many warriors and fishermen from the tribe boarded the new canoe and set out on their journey. Kupe and his whānau were far out to sea, paddling and seeing waiatas in good spirits, when suddenly Tefekio Mutarangi's tentacles broke the surface of the water first searching blindly for food, each one of its arms much longer than Kupe's waka, a tentacle with huge suckers gripped onto the side of their waka, threatening to capsize it. Kupe grasped his midi and slashed at the tentacle, cutting a huge hunk from its flesh. The feki thrashed its arms in agony, but Kupe struck out again. Tefekio Mutarangi's enormous head emerged from the sea, looming over the waka, as the warriors continued to attack the huge tentacle. Kupe pointed his midi at the feki and chanted a spell, ensuring it would never again be able to dive to the depths of the ocean and hide. Tefeki and Muturangi was forced to flee across the surface of the sea. Kupe ordered his warriors into their sailing positions and the chase was on. The chase continued for weeks across the vast Pacific Ocean. Kupe was running out of supplies and still Tefeki and Muturangi managed to keep a distance between them. Finally, one morning Hine to Aparangi saw a long cloud in the distance, a sign that land was near. Hine to Aparangi named the land Aotearoa, land of the long white cloud. Hine to Aparangi, Kupe and the whole whānau were amazed by the beauty of the new land they discovered. 
The stories they'd known as children of Maui fishing a great land from the sea were true. Kupe landed his waka on the east coast of Aotearoa. His people explored the new land and gathered much needed supplies. Kupe took his dog, Tau, across the land to the Hokianga Harbour. They left footprints in the soft clay while walking around the shoreline. Over many years, the footprints turned to stone and have remained there to this day. When Kupe returned, the pursuit resumed down the east coast of the North Island to Rangi Whakawamoa, Castle Point, where Tefiki o Mutarangi sought refuge in a cave known as Tiana o Tefiki o Mutarangi. Kupe realised the Fiki was trapped, but because it was late in the evening, he decided to wait for dawn before launching his attack. During the night, Tefiki o Mutarangi slipped undetected through the black water of the night and back out into open sea. Kupe continued the chase down the east coast until arriving at a huge open harbour, Te Wanganui Atara, Wellington Harbour. Kupe's whanau rested at the head of the fish as Kupe and his warriors continued on the Fiki's trail. Kupe sailed into Te Moana Urukawa, Cook Strait, a turbulent and potentially dangerous stretch of water between the north and south islands of Aotearoa. Knowing the turbulent waters would be an advantage to the Fiki, Kupe chased it into the calmer waters of Totara Nui, Queen Charlotte and Tory Sounds. Because of the many waterways and islands around those areas, the pursuit continued for many days. Kupe finally caught Te Fiki o Mutarangi at the entrance to Te Moana Arukawa from Totara Nui. And the great sea battle began. Te Fiki lashed out with its huge tentacles at Kupe's canoe. Kupe and his warriors manoeuvred their canoe to avoid being overturned. Bracing himself with his legs, Kupe struck at the tentacles with his midi, but the giant Fiki fought back, smashing another of its arms into the side of the canoe, causing a huge gaping hole in the hull. Kupe threw a bundle of gourds overboard, which the Fiki mistook for a person, and attacked. Kupe then jumped from his canoe into the back of the giant Fiki and struck a fatal blow to its head. Tefiki Omutarangi was finally defeated. The eyes of Tefiki Omutarangi were placed on a rock nearby, which to this day is called Na Fatu, the brothers. During Kupe's long absence, Hine Te Aparangi and Nofano were worried that Kupe had been slain by Tefiki Omutarangi and would never return. Matiu and Makaro, his two mokapuna, slashed their breasts with shells as a mark of mourning. Their blood stained the rocks where they stood. These rocks are near the entrance to Te Wanganui Atara Harbour and are now named Parafero, Red Rocks. Kupe did manage to return safely to his Fano at Te Wanganui Atara after successfully defeating Te Fiki o Mutarangi. They all travelled further up the west coast of Te Ika Maui, the North Island, naming many places as they went, finally settling in the Hokianga to replenish their supplies and to ready themselves for their return to Hawaii. Fiki o Mutarangi, which was thought of as a bad omen, had led them to a new land they now called Aotearoa, a land Kupe knew future generations would call home. This is the story of Kupe and Tafiki. Kia ora. I hope you enjoyed that telling of the story of Kupe and the giant Fiki, or Tafiki. I'm hoping to do more of these retellings every so often to break up the information dumps between episodes as I think the stories are not only fun but also shed light on how Mouldy interpreted and explained the world around them. Since this is something a bit experimental for me, it would be great if you could let me know if you liked this or didn't like it and why, what I can improve on and all that sort of stuff. As ultimately, you're the ones who have to listen to this. I just have to sit here and record it. And as my mum would put it, I do like the sound of my own voice, I like to talk a lot, so it doesn't really matter to me so much, but it probably matters to you. So if you don't like it, or you do like it, let me know. I should add that this is only one version of the story. There are lots that have their own style and differences depending on who is telling them and what iwi the story comes from. The version of Kupan and Tefiki that I told was found on the Ministry of Education website and is attributed to Wiramu Grace. I also thought I would clarify a few things from the tale, as there were some terms that we haven't covered yet. I didn't want to be giving you too many definitions during the story, as I thought it would break the flow. And then, let's be honest, those who don't want to listen to the boring bits can switch off. First, is that feki, if you didn't work that out from the story, is the te reo word for octopus. So kupe fights a giant octopus. This particular octopus is the feki o mutarangi, the octopus of mutarangi. 
on account of the animal being his guardian spirit or kaitiaki, as it is sometimes described in other versions. Kupe is also described as a rangatira, which basically means he is of high rank, something like a noble but isn't a chief, and that he lived in Hawaiki, the mythical ancestral homeland of Māori. Tangaroa and Hine Moana are also mentioned, the male god of the sea and the female personification of the sea respectively. So it makes sense that the fishermen would give thanks to these deities after they came back with heavy nets to be divided amongst their whānau. Whānau, meaning family, one of the key social units of Māori society. When the fishermen didn't catch any fish, Kupe called a hui, a meeting, or assembly of the people to discuss issues. After this, when fishing, Kupe recites a karakia, a prayer, in this case, to earn the favour of the gods of the sea and catch more fish. I briefly mentioned it in episode 2, and you may have seen it in the Herman Spoering sketch. Kupe is described as wielding a medi during the initial fight with Tefiki. A medi is a type of patu. Patu are teardrop shaped weapons usually made of bone or wood, meant to be used like a club. Medi are a specific type of patu made of ponamu or greenstone that were hard to make. Thus, they were a symbol of high status, particularly chieftainship, and were possibly passed down through the generations. They did sometimes have sharp, filed edges, so coupe cutting flesh off a tentacle isn't totally outside the realms of possibility. The next part of the story has another nice tidbit from episode 2. Coupe's wife spots land via the cloud formations, even though she can't actually see the land itself. You see this sort of thing throughout the tale, which just goes to show that these weren't just tall tales or myths, they were a way of preserving history in a totally oral tradition. It's mentioned at this point that Maui brought up the fish, which is the North Island, and we will do Maui's myths at a later date. Hopefully we can get Dwayne Johnson to do some voiceovers, but I'm not really sure I can afford him. Anyway, so when they say Coupe's Fano rested at the head of the fish, they mean the North Island in Wellington Harbour. Eventually, we get to the final battle in the Marlborough Sounds, and Tefiki's eyes are turned into islands, the brothers. This is a theme we see across Māori mythology, objects or even people turning into features of the landscape. As a side note, the brothers are the only place where you can find the Brothers Island Tuatara, of which there are less than 500 left. When Kupe returns, he discovers two of his mokapuna have slashed their breasts in mourning, thinking him dead. Mokapuna are grandchildren, so it stands to reason Kupe is likely fairly old in this story. That more or less brings us to the end of the tale and its descriptions. There are other tales of Kupe that we will do, possibly next, or we may do the Māori creation myth next, depending on what you guys prefer. Next time though, we will do a more normal and quote unquote boring episode. Again, let me know what you thought of this and if you want to hear more. It would be great as well if you could recommend some that you want to hear. To do that, you can contact me through email at historyaltearoa at gmail.com or Twitter at History Aotearoa or Facebook at History Aotearoa New Zealand Podcast. We also have a website, historyaltearoa.com, although it is a bit rough at the moment, so I do apologise. As always, haru tu atu, hoki tu mai, see you next time. <laughs>